Hello, I'm John Stanford, Senior Advisor at the International Public Sector Accounting Standards Board, the IPSASB. Welcome to this webcast on ED81, Limited Scope Update, Chapter 3, Qualitative Characteristics, and Chapter 5, Elements in Financial Statements, which IPSASB has just published. This webcast will provide an overview of the key proposals. You may always also find the at-a-glance summary of ED81 helpful. This is available on the IPSASB website, www.ipsasb.org. Thank you for joining me today. Here's what I'll cover. First, a little bit of background on the project, then the key proposals for the two chapters that are affected and how you can respond and how the IPSASB will proceed in the light of comments received on ED81. The objective of the Limited Spoke project is to update the framework in a carefully specified number of areas so as to maintain its role as the cornerstone of the development and maintenance of IPSAS. Why now? Well, there are two catalysts for the project. First, the IPSASB's experience in applying the framework in the development and maintenance of financial reporting standards since its publication in 2014. Secondly, international developments since the framework was finalised, principally the International Accounting Standards Board's finalisation of its conceptual framework in 2018. And I should emphasise that the update project is not a full review of the framework. So we are not looking at each and every aspect of the framework, merely those within the project scope. This is the second of two EDs, which are the outputs of this limited scope project. ED 76, issued last April, proposed changes to the framework chapter on measurement. The IPSASB will start its review of responses to ED76 at its March 2022 meeting. So let's look at the proposed changes to Chapter 3, which are on two subjects, the role of prudence and materiality. Dealing first with the role of prudence, I want to emphasise that there's no intention um, to add prudence as a qualitative characteristic or to make any modifications to the current six qualitative characteristics. However, ED81 does propose adding guidance to the core text on the role of prudence in supporting neutrality in the qualitative characteristic of financial, of, in the qualitative characteristic of faithful representation. The guidance stresses that the exercise of prudence means that assets and revenue are not overstated and liabilities and expense are not understated. Equally, the exercise of prudence does not allow for the understatements of assets or revenue or the overstatements of liabilities or expense. Such misstatements can lead to the overstatement or understatement of revenue or expense in future reporting periods. Prudence does not apply in Prudence does not imply asymmetry. For example, a systematic need for more persuasive evidence to support the recognition of assets or revenue than the recognition of liabilities or expense. The second area where ED81 is proposing some additional guidance is materiality. Here, the main proposal is to add obscuring information to omitting or misstating information as a factor in determining whether information is material. An example of obscuring information is when information is not easily accessible because it's hidden by the luminous disclosures about relatively insignificant items. In other words, unnecessary disclosures can have more than a neutral impact on users' ability to use the financial statements. They can actually have an adverse effect. IPSASB has warned against the adoption of a checklist mentality to decisions on disclosures in a staff paper on materiality in 2017. You might wanna look out for this on the IPSASB website. 
I want to discuss now the proposed changes to chapter five, which is the framework chapter dealing with elements, the building blocks of financial information. First, the change to the definition of an asset. Let's start with the current definition and see how it's changed. In fact, it's very minor, just making past event plural. Why is the Ipsasby suggesting such a small change? Well, the board concluded that the use of the plural past events better conveys the point that resources can accumulate over time due to an initial past event and subsequent past events. An example is a binding arrangement for the delivery of services to third party beneficiaries in which one party receives resources from another party in order to finance the arrangement. The resource recipient accumulates assets and income as it incurs eligibility, eligible expenditure or completes specified activities in accordance with the terms of the binding arrangement. The wording past events includes the scenario where a single past event give rise to an asset. So the main message is one of continuity. The proposed changes to the liability definition are more extensive, although there is no fundamental change to the three components of the definition. Let's start with the 2014 definition and then see what's changed. The Ipsasby has decided that the term transfer of resources is clearer than the current outflow of resources. This proposed change will remove any ambiguity about linkage of the term and outflow of resources with the expectation of such an outflow and therefore potential confusion with recognition thresholds. Consistent with the approach for assets, the IPSASB has considered that the use of the plural past events rather than the singular past event better conveys that present obligations that give rise to liabilities can accumulate over time due to an initial past event and further past events. ED81 proposes some more extensive guidance on a resource and adopts a more overtly rights-based approach to a resource than that in the 2014 framework. A resource is one of the three key components of an asset, and this enhanced guidance reflects its importance. Rights take many forms. Many rights correspond to obligations of another party, such as rights to receive cash, rights to receive goods and services, rights to exchange resources, and rights to benefit from an obligation of another party to transfer a resource if a specified uncertain future event occurs. Some rights don't correspond to obligations of another party, such as rights to use a physical object. And this revised approach to rights does not differentiate legal ownership of a resource from other, resource, other rights to use that resource. ED81 proposes a restructuring of the section on liabilities, providing guidance on the definition that I took you through a couple of slides ago. The guidance is both more extensive than in the current framework, notably on what constitutes a transfer of resources and better aligns with the components of the liability definition. This means that it should be more straightforward to apply in the future, both for the board in its standards development and also for preparers relying on the framework in areas where there isn't a specific stand, specific IPSAS. The guidance clarifies that firstly, an obligation is binding. That is to say that an entity has little or no realistic 
alternative to avoid a sacrifice of resources. Obligations are often legal, but the proposals retain the key point in the 2014 framework that, such ob that obligations may be non-legally binding. Secondly, an obligation must have the potential to require the entity to transfer resources to another party or parties. And thirdly, I think that ED81 is clearer about what elevates an obligation to a present obligation. It notes that a present obligation involves an incremental sacrifice of resources by the reporting entity. The entity will or may have to transfer a resource that it would not otherwise have had to transfer. The ISB's 2018 conceptual framework describes unit of account as the right or the group of rights, the obligation or the group of obligations, or the group of rights and obligations to which recognition criteria and measurement concepts are applied. When the IPSASB finalized the developed and finalized the 2014 framework, it took the board took the view that unit of account was a standards level issue and that there was no need to provide guidance in the framework. However, since 2014, the importance of decisions on the unit of account have been highlighted in a number of IPSASB projects, notably the project on financial instruments that led to the publication of IPSAS 41. This led the IPSASB to reevaluate the case for high level guidance. The IPSASB decided that guidance in the conceptual framework would be beneficial in informing standards levels, requirements and guidance. And the IPSASB drew on the ISB's 2018 framework for this guidance. The paramount criterion for preparers in selecting a unit of account is that the information must be useful to those who rely on the financial statements. Selection of a unit of account should not be confused with offsetting. Offsetting is when an entity recognises and measures both an asset and liability, which are separate units of account, but presents a single net amount. Because offsetting classifies dissimilar items together, it is generally inappropriate. ED81 also provides guidance on binding arrangements that are equally unperformed by both parties. Neither party has fulfilled any of its obligations, or both parties have partially fulfilled their obligations to an equal extent. This guidance is included in the unit of account section rather than a separate section, and the IPSASB consciously does not use the term executory contracts, which, has, which, which is used in the ISB framework. Where do we go from here? Well, the exposure draft includes specific matters for comment or SMCs on which the IPSASB is seeking views. Respondents may choose to answer all eight SMCs or just a selected few. The IPSASB welcomes comments on any other matters within the limited scope of the project that respondents think it should consider in forming its views. The ED is open for comment until May the 31st, 2022. Respondents are asked to submit their comments electronically through the IPSASB website using the submit a comment link. And we ask respondents to submit comments in both a PDF and Word format. You can follow progress on the project by visiting the project page on the IPSASB website and by reviewing IPSASB's e-news, which is issued after each quarterly IPSASB meeting. And of course, you can register to observe an IPSASB meeting virtually. Thank you for watching and listening to this webcast today. 
and for your interest in the work of the Ipsasby.